Good morning. How's everybody doing today? You guys gave Rodney three applauses, so I expect at least that many. <laughs> I'm not going to come in second today. Great, perfect. We're right on point. Number one. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Thank you. Um, we are starting a new series today. Every summer we uh, tend to walk through a book of the Bible, and this year we're going to walk through 1 Timothy. Uh, as Kara read and, and read so well, uh, we're looking at 1 Timothy, and we're looking at it in, in a way of, of describing what it's like to live the Christian faith in a culture that sometimes, not always, but sometimes and very often tends to run counter to what we believe. Culture's not bad, it's not good, it's neutral, and we're a part of the culture around us. But oftentimes our culture around us will ask us to depart from the truth in order to have conformity. That's what culture desires. It desires conformity. It wants unity. And so we've decided to call this series Paradox. And, and as I was thinking this week about what is a paradox, how does this work, how do I know if I'm living in this paradox? And the word that I would use to describe that is if you feel tension between your faith and the world in which you live, you're living in a paradox. If you feel that tension, that sort of unresolved tension, you're living in a paradox. And this week we're talking about truth in an age of falsehood. And what makes falsehood, what makes lies and deception really nasty is when you mix in a little bit of truth. When you mix in truth, that's when falsehood, that's when lies become really easy to believe. How many of you use bleach when you're cleaning your clothes? It's okay. You can admit it. It's, <laughs> it gets our, our clothes whiter than white, our brights brighter than bright, right? Bleach is a good thing unless you mix it with ammonia. If you mix bleach with ammonia, then you know what happens? It becomes a toxic fume and it will kill you. Don't do that. You get nothing else out of this sermon today. You've learned something about ammonia and bleach together. When something good gets mixed with something it's not supposed to be mixed with, it can become lethal. And oftentimes it can be hard to know what's right, what's true, what's good. And frankly, we have to make a lot of those decisions every single day. It can become exhausting. So how can we know what to believe? Well, we're going to look at 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 11 today. We're going to look at the poison of falsehood, the remedy of truth, and then what we do with that. So let's talk about the poison of falsehood. Look at verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons, false teachers, not to teach any different doctrine. So Paul has a problem. He planted a church. In Ephesus, he spent about three years with them in this big city, and then he left. He had other places to go, he had other churches to start. He left them with some very capable elders, people that were going to lead the church. But while he's been gone, guess what happened? Some false teachers came in, and they started leading people away from the truth. Paul hears about it, and he takes Timothy, his protege. The guy's kind of grooming to take over, and he says, Timothy, go address this. Go root out this poison, this falsehood, before it latches on too much and it becomes lethal to the church that we're in, that, that's at Ephesus. Now, when you're poisoned, one of the first things you need to do in order to take care of the fact that you've been poisoned is to know that you've been poisoned, right? If I'm walking through the woods and I feel a sharp pain in my ankle and I look down and I see two bite marks, there's swelling and redness, I know I've been bitten by a snake. I don't have to see the snake to know that I've been poisoned by one. The evidence is clear. So when we're dealing with falsehoods, when we're dealing with buying into lies, how do we know if we've been poisoned by falsehood? How do we know if we've been poisoned by the lies? And there's three things I think we can see, and we see them from the text here. Verse 4, not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. I'm going to stop right there. Myths and endless genealogies. The first thing you need to see is that you're distracted. You get distracted if you're poisoned by a falsehood, you're distracted. Paul talks about myths and endless genealogies. What is he talking about here? Well, the genealogies are probably, these teachers were going into the Old Testament and they were finding Old Testament characters that are only mentioned like once or twice. Think Genesis 5, just a long list of people. And they were going in and they were creating stories around these people. And they were making authoritative teaching based off these characters that are only mentioned once and these stories that they're kind of fabricating about them. At the same time, these myths that they're talking about are not myths like we think of myths. We think of gods and goddesses, Hercules, Thor, all that stuff. 
But what these myths were, according to Plato, a myth was something that is a story that's used to give license to immoral behavior. So they had these false genealogies and they had these myths that were kind of giving them these corrupted ways of living. And you know what Paul calls these? Look at verse 4 again. Devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations. Promote speculations. They're useless. This word speculation means they're not good for anything. They're distracting. They're getting you off course. Paul's issue is not necessarily with the false teaching or even the heresy that's going on, although that's a big deal. His issue is with the fact that it's distracting the people at Ephesus from the very purpose that God has called them to follow. He's mad because they were going, they were doing the right thing. They were following after Christ. And then these folks swoop in and they're all of a sudden distracted. They're brought off course and distracted from once. Again, verse four, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Now, what does that mean? That's kind of a complicated phrase. Here's what I think it means. God has given us a faith, our own personal faith to steward and our faith in community to steward. And that faith, the following of the gospel, the, the trusting of Jesus Christ, that is, God knows that that is the way that we are going to thrive and flourish as a person and as a people. And we've been given that to steward, to take care of. But these myths, these genealogies have come in for the Ephesians, and they've been distracted from this thing that definitely will bring flourishing and thriving, and they're chasing after things that won't, that offer the promise of flourishing but actually don't deliver. They're distracted by these things. What are you distracted by? If you're distracted, if your mind is consumed with things, then you've probably been been poisoned by a falsehood. Maybe you've been poisoned by some political falsehoods. Are you addicted to a news source, one news source in particular? You're always checking, you're always thinking about the news, you're always thinking about what these people say. You're distracted by it. Are you distracted by the lie? Have you been poisoned by the lie that you are what you do? You are what you make. And so your entire life is graded. Your success or your failure is measured by what you accomplish. Is that the falsehood, the poison that you've been struck with? Are you poisoned by the lie of vicarious living? Or if your children or your grandchildren are doing well, then you are doing well. And if they are not, then you are not. Have been poisoned by the lie of leisure, that leisure and rest are the same things, and that everything you do goes to support some kind of hobby, some kind of interest. Are you addicted to sports? You've been poisoned thinking that, man, if I could just go do this, this thing that I enjoy doing, life would be good. And if you're doing that, you're happy, and if you're not, you're not. Are you distracted? That's a good sign that you might be poisoned. You might have bought a lie. But also, Are you self-interested? I'm self-interested. Look at verse 6. Verse 6, we're going to skip verse 5 for a second. We're going to come back to it. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion. So this swerving and wandering, this is not like, oh, they were going well, everything was going good, and these false teachers, they made a couple mistakes, and they wound up in a place that they didn't mean to get to. That's not what's happening. These false teachers know exactly what Paul taught, actually knows what the apostles have taught. They know what's right. And they have intentionally said, the goal is not to grow and to thrive and to mature in the gospel. The goal is to do this other thing over here. They've changed the goal. Now, why have they changed the goal? Why have they changed the goal? Well, we find out in verse 7 that it's probably something to do with self-interest. They want to be well thought of. They want power. They want control. They want status. They've bought and sold falsehoods in order to elevate their brand to the world around them. One of the effects of being poisoned with falsehood is that you take good things, like teaching the word of God, and you make them about yourself. This is one of the ways that you can identify false teaching in a church. It's helpful. How do you know if what I or what Jeff or what somebody else is teaching you is true? That's something you should know. Does the teacher up there talking about themselves all the time, do they talk about their platform or their accomplishments does the teacher follow a cultural vibe over Scripture? Again, it's not, you don't always have to go against culture to be a true teacher. But does it always seem like whatever culture is doing, the teacher you're listening to is like right there in line with it? Might be evidences of a false teacher. Does the teacher question everything but never really provide any solutions of their own? And when they do, it's really just kind of what you want to hear. Does the teacher spend time tearing other people down? 
in order to elevate themselves. It might be a false teacher. Now, it's easy to look on stages. It's easy to look at churches. It's easy to look at TV and be like, yeah, that guy right there smiling back at me. That's a false teacher. But you can apply the same principles to yourself. Are you always talking about yourself, your life, and your successes? Do you always follow culture around you in order to have the easiest path, the path of least resistance, rather than what God has called you to do? Are you always criticizing other people without offering anything else yourself? Do you tear other people down in order to elevate yourself? If that's the case, if you answered yes to all four of those, you're not a false teacher. You're just false. You're not true. We've been poisoned by a falsehood. We're self-interested. We can become self-interested, and it's very easy to do. And if you let poison stay in your body, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. And ultimately, when you've been poisoned spiritually, it comes to this. You become enslaved. Verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either that what they were saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. One of the things that gets mentioned here but gets expanded on later on is that uh, these teachers were using the Bible. Now, when it says the law, this is really important for for where we're going later on in, in our time together. When I'm talking about the law just this morning, I'm talking about the moral code that comes from the Old Testament, okay? I'm not talking about the ceremonial law that has to do with sacrifices. I'm not talking with the legal code that was given to the Israelites as well as a part of that law. I'm only talking about the moral code. And if it helps you, if you want to know what, what kind of how to encapsulate that, just think Ten Commandments. When we say the law this morning, we mean the Ten Commandments and the applications that come from that. Most of the moral law from, uh, that was given to the Israelites on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments is an extrapolation, is an interpretation then of the Ten Commandments, okay? So that's what we're talking about. So they were taking the moral law and they were mixing some things together, these teachers of the law. They were mixing in some Jewish superstition. They were mixing in a sprinkling of uh, Greek philosophy and then just a pinch of asceticism and they were selling it to people. They were giving it to them and people were buying it. You see, that's the problem with falsehood. It's like bleach and ammonia. Something good, actually two something goods in that case, become something very bad. All of us can spot a lie. We struggle to spot lies when they've been mixed with truth. This is because that's how Satan works. The evil one who is the father of lies, he mixes in deception with truth. He does it all the time. And it's lethal to us. It kills us. Jesus says in John 10, 10, he's the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does this by mixing in truth with lies. How does he tempt Jesus in Luke chapter 4? He gives him scripture. He tempts Jesus with truth, but he twists it. He twists what God says. When he goes to Adam and Eve in the garden, what does he do? He twists God's words around. He takes truth, and then he adds in the deception. Falsehood and truth together is lethal to us. And many of us have bought lies. Many of us have bought falsehoods. And you know when we bought them? We buy some of them now, sure. But many of us got poisoned with falsehood when we were real, real little. Really little. So many of us sought the approval of our parents. Or we thought that success made people like us. Or that having things made us happy. And we never stopped believing that. We never grew out of it. I believe that God only loved us if we were good little boys or good little girls, and now you're 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 years old, and you're still trying to be that good little boy or girl so that God will love you. And it's a lie you got sold. And just like poison in a child is much more lethal than in an adult, a spiritual poison in a child is much more lethal than it is in an adult. Because it has time to grow. It has time to latch on to their hearts. Now, this is why VBS is so important. This is why we take kids' ministry here very seriously. Because it's not just a kids' ministry. We're not just playing games. We're inoculating our children against falsehood. And it's not, some of you might sit there, well, yeah, you're indoctrinating them and all sorts of, no. I'll tell you what I want our children indoctrinated with. That God loves them. That they are valuable. That God loves them so much 
that he sent his son to die for them. He gave up his kid for them. And that the lies that they run into their life, that they have to earn God's love or that he's disappointed with them or that he's frustrated with them, I want them to be completely inoculated from that. Yes, they need to know that they are broken, but they need to know that there's salvation, that there's hope, and there's a healer for them. And if that's indoctrinating a kid, then I'll do it all day long because I want them to have hope and I want to have real hope and a Savior. And I want you to join us in that. You can participate in VBS. Just give us a day if you can to come and help kids battle back against falsehood, against lies. We talk a lot about at-risk kids, right? There's always that thing talked about, at-risk kids, at-risk kids. Every child is at risk of buying some kind of spiritual poison that could really change their life. And it's on us to address it. So, Travis, that sounds pretty grim. Just going to be honest with you. It sounds encouraging in some regard, but it sounds pretty grim. Is there hope? If I'm distracted, if I'm, if I'm self-interested, if I'm enslaved, is there hope? Of course there is. Because truth is the remedy. There's the remedy of truth. Go back to verse 5. Paul says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Paul is saying that their charge, meaning their teaching, as opposed to the false teachers, will result in love. So when you're poisoned with something, right, you get sick, and you get sick and sick, and there's symptoms. How do you know if you're getting better? You stop being sick. If you've got food poisoning and you stop being in the bathroom, that's a sign that you're getting better. Again, I think I'm the only person that struggles with food poisoning. I've used that joke twice, and it just goes flat. (laughs) It's where you get sick from eating, people. Goodness. One of the ways that we can measure whether or not we're being rescued from falsehood is if we're becoming more loving. If love is increasing in our life, if love is is growing, it's what it says. The aim of our charge is love. That means that love is the motivation for using truth and it multiplies more love. That's the purpose of teaching truth. That's the goal of truth is to increase love. That's how we know that truth is being rightly administered. And here's the problem. For many of us in the room and many of you watching online, truth and love are the farthest things from each other. Because truth was administered, sure, in your life, but it was used as a bludgeon. It was used as a weapon. It was used as a a guilt trip. You were given truth as a kid or as a young adult or even today. But you were given truth in the same way that shock therapy functions. You were given a spiritual lobotomy with truth in order to create some kind of moral person so that you look a certain way on the outside even though you're not lining up that way on the inside. Now, here's the problem. That's another falsehood that you've bought because truth and love always go together. Here's why. Jesus describes himself. He says uh, in John, I think John 14, he says, I am the way the truth, and the life. So Jesus says, I am the truth, okay? So he's the embodiment of truth. Now, we believe that Jesus is divine. We believe he's the son of God. And elsewhere in 1 John, which we read from today, it says that God is love. So if we believe that Jesus is God, we believe that he is also love. And so if he is love and he says he's the truth, that means love and truth coexist inside of a person. He is the embodiment of love and truth, and you can't divide those things. You can't separate love and truth in the same way that you can't separate Jesus' humanity from his divinity. They go together, they're sisters, love and truth. They're not opposites. Paul says their goal when they teach, when they instruct, when they use truth, when they bring forth the remedy of truth, is to bring it about with love so that it increases love. Truth should be administered with love, with a good bedside manner and a gentle hand. So where does this come from? Look again at verse 5. Our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. A sincere faith. A sincere faith. How do we get access to these things? What are these things? Well, a pure heart is one that is submitted to God. It's one that submits to the Lord. 
A good conscience is the opposite of what the Bible calls a seared conscience. Uh, sin has come into our lives. We're, we're all sinful. And because of that, our consciences aren't quite as sensitive as they need to be. They've been dulled. They've been seared. And so when Christ comes into our life, we, we have a, a good conscience again. And then a sincere faith is one that issues from an honest heart. Now, how do you get these things? How do we have access to these things? Well, it's from the person of Jesus Christ. You don't get a pure heart. You don't get a good conscience. You don't get sincere faith on your own. Left to my own devices, left to my own efforts, I will not act out of love. My efforts to use truth will always be harmful in some way, shape, or form, just like the religious leaders. In the Gospels, we always dog on the Pharisees. They had access to truth. And honestly, when it came to truth, they were right a lot of the time. They weren't always wrong, but they didn't use truth with love. And so people were oppressed. They were burdened by it. And here's the thing. Apart from Christ, I will always be poisoned. There will always be some part of me that's distracted. There will always be some part of me that's self-interested. And there's always going to be some part of me that's enslaved. Always apart from Christ. And what's worse is, I'll pass that on to other people. I'll poison other people. I will make them distracted by myself Because I'm self-interested, I'll use them for my own ends, and then I'll enslave them to the very same things I'm enslaved to as well. But you see, what happened was truth and love comes to earth in a person, the Son of God, and he dies, he bleeds and dies to draw the poison of falsehood from us, to take it away from us. Rather than our blood being shed, Right, the old school way of getting rid of poison, right? You, you cut the poison part away rather than us being cut. No, 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 no. Jesus was pierced. Jesus bled. Truth and love on the cross for you and for me. Now, if you get bit by a snake and you go home and you're like, I'm not going to worry about it. I got this. I'll take care of this on my own. Everyone, hopefully, in your household will look at you like you're an idiot. And they should. Nobody would, would give you any grief for going to the hospital and getting an anti-serum, right? So when I sit here and tell you that the only way you're going to be free from the falsehoods that you believe, the falsehoods that, you, that have been hooked in you since you were little, is to go to Jesus Christ. He's the only one that has a remedy. Why do people think that that's not true? Why do we continue to try and save ourselves? Why do we continue to try and draw the poison out on our own? If you're bit by a snake, go to the hospital. If you're poisoned with the falsehoods, of spiritual falsehoods, Go to Jesus Christ, get well, be healed, believe. All you have to do is believe that he's the only one that can rescue you from the things that have distracted you, the things that enslave you, and the things that make you focused on yourself. He's the remedy, he's the truth, and he comes with love. He's the one that comes with love. So how do we do this? Because if we're a believer in Jesus, we also need to go back to him again and again and again. Not for salvation. We already have that. If we've trusted him to be the remedy once, it counts for our whole lives. We continue to persevere in the faith. But here's the thing. A lot of us got vaccinated, at least I hope we did, because I'm seeing a lot of faces. I could have gotten some applause there. I'm just kidding. A lot of us got vaccinated. And when you, many of us went and got a vaccination and when we went and got, we got a second shot, right? Because we needed like a booster for, for some reason. Again, I don't understand the science behind it. I just went and got it. As followers of Jesus, we need to continually go back to Christ. We need to go back to the gospel again. Go back to the truth and be like, Jesus, I'm struggling today. I'm buying lies. I'm buying falsehoods. I'm poisoned again today. And Jesus doesn't look at us and be like, oh, you numbskull. How do you keep getting bitten by the same snakes over and over and over again? It's not how Jesus acts. Jesus says, come here, I'm going to take care of you. Come here, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to give you the healing you need because he loves you. And so we go back again and again. Don't hide from him. Don't run from him. Don't sit there and try and grit through the poison on your own. Go to Jesus. One of my favorite songs that we sing here, and we don't sing it nearly as often as I want to, is I will arise and go to Jesus. And what? He will embrace me in his arms. 
And that's how you get free from the poison of falsehood. That's how you get the remedy of truth. So this is all nice, and how do we get practical about it, Travis? Well, I want us to read the label. Read the label, verse 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So I'm going to stop right there. The law is good if one uses it lawfully. What does that mean? The law is good for two reasons. Again, the Old Testament moral law, think, old, think Ten Commandments. It's good, one, because the creator that gave it to us is good. The law is good because God is good, okay? So that's one thing we take on faith. The second reason why it's good that Paul talks about here is lawfully used. So what is the law? What is the Old Testament law lawfully used? What does that mean? Well, the law really has three purposes for us in our day and age. The first purpose is to push us towards Christ. The law is basically there to make you feel bad. You're supposed to look at the Ten Commandments and look especially at Jesus' commentary on the Old Testament, and you're supposed to sit there and be like, oh my gosh, I cannot keep all those commands. I need a savior. I need someone who's going to rescue me. I need somebody to draw out the poison. I can't do it on my own. That's purpose number one for the law. Purpose number two is a deterrent. You know why I don't drive 100 miles an hour down Northwest Highway? One is because I'm being filmed right now, and I would never confess to that on camera. (laughs) Two are there's these little signs on the road that say 35 miles an hour. And I always go 35 miles an hour. 35 miles an hour. It's a deterrent. They're there to deter me. They're like speed bumps, right? When you go through a parking lot and there's speed bumps to keep you going too fast. It's a deterrent. The law is there as a deterrent. We're supposed to look at the Old Testament, look at the Ten Commandments and be like, ah, killing somebody's not great. Let's not do that then. Okay, let's talk about our problems. And then afterwards we feel like killing each other. But that's a different story. The third reason, the third purpose of the law is to tell me what right living looks like, to tell me how to follow God, how to respond to his love and obedience. Now, as a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the first two don't don't apply to you anymore. Here's why. One, you don't need to feel guilty anymore. You don't need to look at the law and feel bad anymore. You know why? Jesus Christ paid for your sins. So every time you break the law, there's Jesus Christ. There's grace for you. As sin increases, grace increases all the more. So it doesn't serve that purpose anymore. You don't have to feel bad when you read the Ten Commandments. The second one doesn't work either. It's not supposed to be a deterrent. You know why? I don't need the law to tell me not to do bad things anymore. I have the Spirit of God living inside of me. My conscience is no longer seared. I have a guide. Now, it's good to have the law. It's good to read the Scriptures. But I don't have to to feel guilty, and I don't have to have the law because I have the Spirit of God guiding me. But here's the third thing. I do need it to tell me how to respond to God in worship. It is a good guide God has told us, you want to have a relationship with me? Great. You have it through my son. You have it by grace. But when we have that relationship, there are rules that govern our interaction. There are ways that you can honor me. There are ways that you can interact with me. And there are ways that you are not supposed to do that. And if you want to show gratitude, if you want to show worship, this is how you do it. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not murder. Honor your father and mother. Those things. All right? And this is what I mean by read the label. Look at verse 9. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Now we look at this list and we think, wow, that's just a list of really bad things that you shouldn't do. That's not what Paul's doing. He's taking the Ten Commandments and he's applying them. Each one of these that are listed are an application of the Ten Commandments with the exception of coveting. Coveting is not on here. So like enslaving, he talks about enslavers. Why is he coming against them? That's a violation of the Eighth Commandment. Don't steal. Because people would kidnap other human beings and they would take them to a market and they would sell them. And Paul's saying, based on the Eighth Commandment, do not steal, that's wrong. Don't do that. That's not how you honor God. And this is what I mean by read the label. When you have pharmaceutical drugs, when you have medicine in your medicine cabinet, you can look at the label and you can see who it's intended for. It's written by a legitimate doctor. It tells you how much to use and when. And if you violate any of those, you no longer have medicine that helps you. It becomes bad. It becomes a poison. This word of God is good. It is meant for you to read, to read the label, to know what it says so that we can combat falsehoods in our lives. 
It's given to you so that you can know that God loves you and you can know how you're supposed to walk in your life. Read the label. Know what it says. Be in the Word. If you want to get started, one of the things we're encouraging everyone to do this week, read 1 Timothy 1. Just read through the passage. Read through it every day. It's not long. And ask yourself, what falsehoods, what lies have I been poisoned with? What falsehoods are drawn out from this passage in my own life? And how can I go to Jesus to be healed from them? Read the label. Now, to show you what I mean by this, I want us to look at the biggest hot button item in this passage. I want us to look at verse 10. And it says, the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality. That's obviously a charged statement in our day and age. Now, I don't have time to dive into this topic completely. I wish I did, but I don't. But what I want us to do is I want to take this verse in context. I want us to talk about what it means. And I'll hopefully address some times when truth was not used well. When truth was used as a bludgeon and as a weapon. And I want us to learn how we can talk about this. Because here's what I think. I think if maybe we as a church, and not just Park Cities, but a capital C church, if we had learned how to talk about truth with love a little sooner, particularly when it comes to the issues of human sexuality, we perhaps wouldn't be in the situation where we're in right now where there's a great deal of distrust between ourselves and the LGBT community, and there's a great deal of conflict and fear and misunderstanding. So the word here in Greek literally means men having sexual relationships with men. But notice what it's listed alongside of, sexual immorality. So again, remember, each one of these is derived from the Ten Commandments. This one, these two both come from the Seventh Commandment, do not commit adultery. And so what Paul's saying here is a violation of the Seventh Commandment, do not commit adultery, is sexual immorality and men having sexual relationships with other men. Homosexuality in general is the way that we've interpreted it. What is included in sexual immorality? What, how do we interpret that today? Well, pornography, masturbation, uh, cohabitation, sex before marriage, actually cheating on your spouse. I would even throw in there watching sex scenes in movies. All forms of sexual immorality. And according to Jesus, looking lustfully at another human being is considered a violation of sexual morality. So notice that sexual immorality and all that that entails is listed here alongside homosexuality, acting, uh, homosexual acts. So what does this tell you? They're equal in the same sense. It's the same commandment that we're violating, the commandment on adultery. And what we have done is we have condemned one group of people that do one thing and the other group of people we have not. We've offered forgiveness, we've offered uh, recovery groups, we've done all sorts of stuff over here for the sexually immoral group, but this one specific group of people we have not done that for. We have not been gracious and kind. Now, we can speak the truth, but we've not found a way to do it in a way that is loving and non-discriminatory. The other thing I would say is that this passage offers no, uh, no guidance on how to handle this legally in our country or in regard to business practices. There's no guidance here on that. We like to say that our country is based on the Ten Commandments. It's not. Our legal code is not based on the Ten Commandments because it's not illegal to make idols. It's not illegal to lie to somebody. I can lie to Rodney to his face. I do all the time. I'm just kidding, not really. It's not illegal to cheat on my wife. It's not illegal to look at pornography. It's not a, a legal code. The purpose of the U.S. legal code and the purpose of the Word of God are two totally different things. The U.S. legal code is designed to create an ordered society. It's designed to to protect people from injustices. That's what it's there for. The Word of God is designed to call people to worship and repentance. The U.S. legal code offers no such function, and when we try to make it do that, It winds up getting weaponized, and it winds up hurting people. Now, here's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that you can't go vote your conscience. I think you should. I think everyone should vote their conscience. Vote your morality. I think that's when a democracy functions best. But we have to stop expecting the laws in our country to do the job of the Word of God because it's not that, and it never will be because it's not inspired by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Nice. Thank you. That's two. 
So with all that said, what would I say? There's somebody probably in this room who maybe is struggling with same-sex attraction. Maybe you're practicing homosexual. Maybe you're watching online, and that's where you find yourself. And the whole time I've been talking about this, you've just been sitting on pins and needles because you're worried about what I'm going to say because you're afraid just more damage is coming your way. Well, let me just be honest because I'm talking to you, and I want to talk to the people uh, in our congregation as well. Up front, I agree with the text. I think that homosexuality, practicing homosexuality, is not God's best design for your life. And I would say the same thing to somebody struggling with pornography. I would say the same thing to to somebody uh, who's, who's gambling, stealing, whatever, addicted to all that stuff. But I will say this. The church, capital C Church, has done a very poor job of guiding people to talk about their sexuality. And we have not been a safe place for people to do that. And what has happened over the years is that when people have a conflict between the truth that they're being bludgeoned with and what they're feeling inside, they've gone and found groups of people where they can be accepted. And to be honest with you, I don't blame you one bit. I'd probably do the same thing. I understand. And over the years, we haven't understood. And I don't know that I fully understand, but I at least understand that, the sense of feeling rejected. And so here's what I would say to you right now, and here's what I would encourage you, if you have family members or friends, and and this is a topic that comes up, here's what I would encourage you to say. I would encourage you to say two words. Come back. Come back to the church. If you've left, if you're scared, if you're worried, come back. Forgive us for not having spoken the truth in love, Forgive us for not knowing how to handle a really complicated issue. Forgive us for not listening. Forgive us for abusing truth. And at the same time, let us help each other. Because we have things we struggle with as well. And we need people to come and speak truth to us in love. And frankly, I would rather be around a group of people that speak the truth to me in love than people that just tell me what I want to hear all the time. Because at least I know they're being honest. We all are surrounded by struggles. We are all poisoned and infected with falsehoods. Happens all the time. And we need each other to be the body of Christ, to rescue us from the poisons and the falsehoods that we face all the time. We need the community of believers. That's how God has chosen to work now in the Holy Spirit era, in the church age. And this is why we take this. This is why we take the Lord's Supper. You can go ahead and grab your elements Because this is why we take the Lord's Supper. It is a physical reminder that we are not alone. So much of our faith is in things we can't see. We're supposed to trust that Jesus was raised from the dead. We don't see him now. We don't see the Holy Spirit working in our midst. And Jesus knows this. And he gives us this. He gives us a piece of bread. And he gives us fruit from a vine. And he says, when you do this, you remember me. And you remember that it's real. That it's real. And so what Jesus did was, and you can open the bread part now. He took bread on the night that he was to be betrayed and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. And every time you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. You can take and eat. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he blessed it. And he said, this is the new covenant, which is made in my blood. And every time you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Don't be poisoned by falsehoods anymore. Go to Jesus for the remedy of truth. And then read the label, read the word of God that he's given us that we might be further inoculated against the falsehoods that come at us all the time. You are loved dearly by God, and you are loved by this church as well. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, I give you praise that you have blessed us with real things, physical things that we can do to remember that our God loves us. Lord, I pray for grace for everybody here, everybody watching online, that's enslaved with a falsehood, that's bought a lie. I pray that you would rescue us, that you would redeem us, that your gospel would 
draw out the poison and that we would go and share love and truth with everyone we meet, the truth that our God loves us and he died for us. May you bless those who are hearing your word today. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen.